Welcome to Dev Bootcamp Live, the podcast where we help you level up so you land your first engineering job and become the best engineer on your team. I'm Juan Lizarazo. And I'm Jared Potter. And today, Jared, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're not going to talk, talk about like a specific technical topic, but we're going to talk about the uh, a specific part of the interview. When you are out there interviewing, there's multiple stages to the interview and there's multiple factors deciding whether you coming for a on-site interview or if you make it to the technical interview, if you get an offer. So we're going to be talking about those other aspects that are the non-technical aspects for the interview when, when it comes to software engineering positions. And this is very important because both of us, Jared, you and I, we have done interviews. So we have been on the other side, right, as interviewers. And there's it depends on the companies. There's some specific training about that and some specific things that either recruiters or the managers are looking for. So the idea is to share to share tips with our audience about that portion because many of them are interviewing right now and many of them are not getting the interviews and they don't know why. Maybe they're very technical, but they're still not getting the interviews. So we're going to talk about those tips to land that technical portion of the interview to land your first engineering job. So um, to start, Jared, I just want to like share a little bit of the of the of the process. Like when you apply at a job, usually you're going to get contacted by a recruiter if you are applying to a bigger company, right, that has on-site recruiters. And usually they are going to call you and they're going to do what's called a phone screening, right, uh, where they're going to determine if you're a good fit. So this is something that is called the fit interview. And this fit interview, I mean, even if it is a phone screen or you're going to talk to the recruiter, you're really going to be interviewed even if you don't know it, right? When they call you and they ask you some questions, they want to determine if it is worth moving forward and spending more resources on the interviewing process because interviewing is expensive. So that's that portion of the interview. Another portion sometimes is with the same recruiter or sometimes is with a manager before the technical interview. And that's the value-based interview when um, the company, the interviewers determine if you are a good fit for the company, uh, if you have the values they're looking for. So we're going to be talking about tips around all uh, at that stage, right? Since after you apply and you get the, the call from the recruiter until you before the technical interview. So we're going to focus on that today, Jared. So let's start. Uh, Jared, share with us a, the first, you know, item tip thing to keep in mind for this process. Yeah, definitely. So uh, just like you're saying, Juan, right from the very beginning, when you get the phone call from the from the recruiter, you know, after you've scheduled to, to make this happen, you know, oftentimes these days, it's going to just be on the phone call. Sometimes it might be a video call. But kind of my first tip is going to be around really making sure that you're trying to, you know, obviously just be very polite, you know, try to project a level of energy and interest in the company to show that you are just interested. If, 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 the, if the conversation simply goes where the you know, the, the recruiter is asking all the questions or driving the entire conversation and you're just simply saying yes or no, right? That's not really what they're looking for, right? They, they're trying to give you an opportunity to, you know, express yourself, to explain your skills, your value, and, you know, how you can bring that uh, to the company. So uh, yeah, kind of just the general first tip is trying to do your best to project confidence, you know, try to be friendly, um, as necessary, even being able to ask maybe some more off the cuff questions a little bit, just to add, you know, add a little bit of human aspect to it, rather than it being just purely, um, you know, exactly about, you know, the position and whatnot. Um, but again, re well, you can also feel the conversation out with the recruiter, you know, you know, you, you know, and you can kind of direct it in different directions. Uh, but that would be kind of my first point is just, again, try to, try to, again, project, you know, you know, if you, even if you're not, don't have the personality that's always super bright and excited and things like that, uh, you know, maybe practice doing some mock interviews with some friends if you have, you know, access to, to different people. Um, and also for, uh, if you have friends in the actual, you know, industry to be able to ask them maybe to do some mock interviews to kind of get that practice in place would be kind of my first tip there. Okay, that's awesome, Jared. And something that relates to that, um, the first thing I'm going to share relates to that, which is once the recruiter reach out, right? When they reach out, don't take too long to reply. If you apply to a company and they reach out, try to respond within 24 hours. If you don't, they'll move on because when you're a bootcamp graduate, competition is tough. There's hundreds and hundreds of graduates every month from all the bootcamps there are, right? So it's really 
like there's there's a lot of market out there, so they'll they're not gonna wait around. So it's important as part of showing up that showing that excitement, right? Even if it is through email, reply quick. If they reply and you're you're looking for a job and you're available, right? You hit the email, reply right away. I mean, like show that you're really truly interested. But if not, try to reply within 24 hours. That's very important. And also the responsiveness. Um, what you said about the yes, no questions, that's very important. Don't just answer yes, no. Uh, do you want to work as a software engineer? Yes. Um, can you start in two weeks? Yes. It, like that's kind of like boring. It's kind of like, yeah, you know what? Maybe you're, you're not a good fit. It, it's part of that fit interview when they want to determine if you're really excited. So the first tip is, you know, be very responsive, reply within 24 hours. Um, usually like something that is related, uh, many recruiters are going to, because for, for tech jobs, they're going to send you some sort of uh, quiz or some sort of technical exercise, some sort of uh, challenge, right? And this is just to discard and make sure that like you have some skills that you know how to code before bringing you on site or uh, involving more engineers. And the reason for this is because engineers time is expensive, right? If you bring two people for an interview, you're paying two people two hours, right? So that's costing because he's interviewing. So you don't even know if you're going to hire the person. So then 10 interviews, right, is 20 hours worth of time, human hours, man hours, right, uh, or woman hours. Uh, so it, it's very important that um, you're responsive. But when they send you a challenge or something, usually another thing is like, don't take weeks to completely complete it. If you're really applying, and let's say this, they send you a coding challenge, there's two key things here, and that this is this is very important. This is what they don't tell you. So, so that's what we're sharing here today. Um, the first thing here that is very important is that when they send you a coding challenge, um, they're going to ask you, when can you have it done by, right? Like, how long is it going to take you? Can you do it what day? So if you say, I can have it done tonight, or I can do it tomorrow, you're setting yourself with a commitment. So you better make sure you fully meet that commitment. So if you say, let's say it's Tuesday and you say, well, I'm busy interviewing, but I can complete this over the weekend. You better do it over the weekend and send it Sunday night at the latest. So then Monday morning, they have it because you made a commitment. If you don't do that, kind of like they're going to move on. They're going to be like, you know what? He didn't meet his own deadline. We're going to move on. That's something very important. The second thing is that if they send you and let's say they say, when can you have it done by? And you say a week. That's also not good because it's kind of like, well, a whole week, but how do you compare against the person, the other candidate that I sent the same challenge and they say they could have it done by tomorrow. And today is Tuesday, let's say, then that means that tomorrow I have it. Maybe I can have that person interview on Wednesday or Thursday, right? Move on. So that's not really good because if you take a whole week to do a coding challenge that usually takes between one or four and four hours, that's kind of like the industry average for those coding tests, then um, you know, they're going to move on. And one more thing, you don't, because you're a bootcamp graduate, right? You just graduated. You're a new software engineer, aspiring software engineer. You don't have the luxury of just saying, I don't apply to companies that, or I don't work with companies that send me a coding challenge. You don't get to have that luxury. You get that when you are already established engineer, right? And you get to say like, well, you know what? I'm busy. I'm not going to do that test. And you move on to the next company that doesn't require that if that's what you want. But if you're truly interested in the company, you most likely will complete the test at any stage of your career. So that shows, shows also some humility, right? Like you're, you're humble about your skills because you're really interested in what the company is doing. So that's kind of like my tip there, super long dread. What do you think about those, those uh, tips about like, you know, landing your first interview? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's crucial to be, you know, if, if, I mean, you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to get a response back from recruiters, cause don't get me wrong, you have to send out a lot of applications before you're going to get any emails back. Yeah. Be responsive. Um, you know, be realistic with your, with your, commitment to potential coding challenges or, you know, initial screening challenges that they're going to send you. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's, those are very important tips um, to embrace in the very early stages of, of any sort of interview. Uh, my, my kind of my next tip that I would kind of bring to the table here would be to ask questions. Okay. So I'm going to kind of unpack this a little bit. And I know it seems kind of almost cliche, but come prepared to be able to ask questions, um, you know, to both the recruiter and also as you get into later stages of, you know, talking to some of the engineers that might be doing the technical challenge 
or to managers that might be, you know, that you're hiring that are maybe doing like the last interview, perhaps before they, you know, present an offer. Being able to have questions prepared and also maybe having questions that are targeted best towards different groups does multiple things. Number one, it shows the company that you have interest in this, you know, in their company. Um, you want to learn more about them. Remember that an interview is not just a one-way relationship of, you know, you beg in the company for a job. You know, it's a two-way, you know, dating situation where you're trying to determine, hey, do I like them? Do I want to spend and commit a lot of my time to them? And of course, they're asking that same question, um, you know, if they want to be able to do that. But you can also gain a lot of great insight into this. You know, when you're talking to the engineers, you can always ask about what, what kind of stack that they're using. You know, you could also ask them about uh, work-life balance. Oftentimes I find that if you actually are asking the actual engineers or, or other people who are, you know, in the trenches, if you will, working on things, they'll give you pretty candid answers about what it's like to work there. What's the work-life balance? You know, how many hours a week might, you know, are they working? And these are legitimate questions that you should be able to ask. And hopefully they'll be able to, you know, provide, uh, you know, real, realistic answers um, in, in response. So yeah, my, 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 my second tip here is, yeah, definitely just to be able to come prepared with a set of different questions and ask different questions to different groups of people that, um, you, know, you, you know, depending on which group they are, if they're the recruiter or their engineers or a manager, uh, what have you, you know, come prepared with those questions and be able to ask those questions. You can also um, ask benefit questions, right? I always ask benefit questions in my interviews um, about things like their retirement accounts or savings accounts or things like that because um, they're relevant points, you know, that you're comparing with what your current situation is uh, and, and whatnot. So I guess Juan, what, what's your, do you have maybe a couple of questions that you like to ask companies uh, when you're yeah. interviewing and, and what yeah. are you looking to get out of it when you ask those questions? So part of being prepared, right, is that like in that preparation, you are researching the company. So that's super important. When you talk, when you have that call to the, with the recruiter, always know what the company is doing, what the company is, uh, is about, how big is the company. Uh, also do your research and find how many people work at the company, check Glassdoor, look at reviews, look at like what people have to say about the company, how long have they been in business, right? It's not the same applying for a company that you started a month ago and you just raised a million dollars versus a company that's well-established and has been in business for five years and is highly profitable or stuff like that, right? Figure out if they have VC, right? Uh, because it's different when they're profitable or not, right? It depends on like what stage they're at and also how that aligns with your career. So questions to ask. So once you do your research, you're going to be better prepared to ask questions because you might have questions out of that research. Let's say you see in Glassdoor that, hey, 20 people complain that they fire half of the engineering department. Just an example. Then that's something you could ask. Like, hey, look, I read on Glassdoor that a lot of people complain about this. Do you have any insight? What happened? Initially, they'll be able to answer those questions or explain. Uh, other things you can find, like, for example, they can say, like, for example, in the reviews and benefits, they can say, like, oh, um, they have great benefits or something like that. So you might have questions about that depending on what you're looking for, right? Like, for example, let's say health insurance is important to, for you. You can ask about that, right? Um, usually I recommend personally, and I have a different point of view. Usually I don't ask and I don't recommend asking about benefits early or, or in the first call because that just shows that like you're just more interested about the benefits and not so much about the challenges, right? But this is the thing. When you get to the negotiating state, you can ask all those questions and that's going to be the determining factor. So it depends like... Oh, on your style. I mean, it's okay to ask. One of the important things, Jared, is that like this question, uh, this is the, the, the question that like when people are new to the industry, they had to struggle with. Usually the director is going to ask you, what, sal what is your salary range or what, what number are you looking for to make annually, right? So you got to be prepared with that. If you don't, if you say, I don't know, you're really saying, I don't know my worth. I don't know how much my skills are worth. So the recruiter is going to be like, you know what? You don't know that. So we're not going to just figure it out. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't know your worth. We're going to go with a candidate that will, right? They're not going to tell you that. So it's very important that you have clarity with that. Let's say you graduated from a bootcamp graduate. The first thing you're going to do is that you're going to go to Glassdoor, right? And you're going to find how much that company pays engineers or how much in the, that area, like LinkedIn and Glassdoor have ranges for, let's say we're in Salt Lake City. So 
junior software engineer salaries and you can find ranges and you say, you determine, and this is very important, you determine how much they pay in the area you live or if it is a remote job, how much they pay the remote employees. And the reason for this is because it's not the same, let's say, for example, in Utah, we say, you know, a bootcamp graduate makes this much, but then you are in California. It's not going to be the same thing. You cannot use that for negotiation. It doesn't make sense. Or same here. Here we cannot ask for like a California salary because we do not live in California. Even if we work with a remote company in California, doesn't matter. I mean, we don't live in California. And usually that's also going to determine things because companies, they are smart, right? They know how to save costs, right? They're not going to like just throw money away. So keep that in mind. And about the specific questions to be prepared, like, you know, like, um, for example, um, how much did you grow last year? Right. That's a good question. Um, what new products and features are you working on? Or how are you looking to expand your engineering department? How many people work in the engineering department right now? And how many people are you expecting to hire by the end of the year? These questions are going to show that you have done your research, that you are really interested on the growth of the company. So it's not going to be just a paycheck. And also that is going to tell you, like what you were saying, Jared, a two way, right? It's going to tell you, like, are they really growing? Because that's always a good sign for a company, a company that is actively hiring. That's a great sign. It doesn't mean like they're just firing people and just rehiring, you know, backfilling. No, that means they are growing. And when a company is growing, that means their customers are growing, they're making more money and they are not only making more money, they are reinvesting that money back into the business. And that's very important because when you have a company that is not hiring constantly, but they make millions of dollars, that means that maybe, you know, maybe the, the, the owners are just like not looking to expand. They're just looking to, you know, keep it balanced, keep it there, make their good money, you know. So it's very important to, to keep that, that in mind. So those are good questions to ask. Uh, how big are the teams? Uh, what's the technology stack? Always has that. Even the recruiter, the recruiters are prepared because they're technical recruiters. They might not be software engineers. Some of them are, and they will tell you specific things about the stack. And this is very important because let's say you worked with PHP and you don't like it, right? It's okay. PHP is great, but not everybody likes it, right? So let's say they say, well, we work 80% of all of our backing is PHP and then the front end is React and you will have to do PHP. Then that will be good to, for you to know or evaluate, do you want to get back to PHP or you don't really want to do that? And you can just let them know, be honest, be like, you know what? I don't want to work with PHP. So then the interview can end right there, but then you don't waste time. They don't waste time. So those are important questions. Tech stack, right? Growing plans, how much hiring, how big is the department, how much is going to grow, right? Uh, what features are being built next? Because if it is a company that is doing just maintenance, right? It's not the same that a company that is creating new features. That's going to give you a different sense. Do you want to maintain code you didn't write? Or do you want to help write some new code on a proven, well-established business, right? So all yeah. these questions are very important to determine that, Jared. Um, yeah, and those absolutely. are like the tips along, along the way, asking, uh, answering your question. Yeah. No, oh, wonderful. Um, uh, is it my turn? <laughs> I think it's my turn. Well, I was going to add, um, so, so, so I was going to share, no, I was answering, <laughs> but like the tip, the short tip I was going to answer, like I, I mentioned this, but I didn't complete it. Sorry. Um, when they say like, what's your, remember what I said about the worth, what's the number you're looking for? So this is very important. People struggle with this. You don't have to say a number but always provide a range. And how do you provide a range? Because you're gonna do your research beforehand and you know how much they pay in the area, how much they pay their engineers through Glassdoor, through LinkedIn. And then you're gonna determine a range and you're gonna say, well, my the range I'm looking for is between this and this much. And the range, I mean, usually don't create a big gap, like lower range and then the higher end double, right? Double the total. No, that is not going to work. It's too wide. If you give a giant range, range, that means like you don't know your worth and then you're just like aiming high and see what happens. That's not going to get you a job. Usually they're going to be like, you know what? It's out of our range, right? But usually you just give a specific range. Maybe um, I would say like 15% difference between the range, 15, 20% max, no more than that, right? Give that range, keep in mind, the lower end of the range is the lower amount you are willing to accept if they were to offer you a job. Be careful with this. Let's say you say, hey, I want, I'm just, I'm not going to give amounts because we have different markets, but let's say you say, you know what? I want $5 a year, right? Between five and $7 a year, let's say. Then if you say $5, it's okay because that's the lower range. And let's say the range is between three and $5, then for you, you are in their higher end, but it has your lower end. So they might give you an offer for $5 a year. So 
Remember, the lower number you give, make sure that that's a number you're willing to accept because sometimes it will happen. Many companies will get back to you with the maybe mid of the range or the top of the range, depending how you perform uh, and other factors. But keep in mind, ranges are not just like for saying them. And another thing, once you share a range, right, you cannot change your mind. You cannot come back and say, you know what? I don't really want, I want this, you know, you can like, I mean, things happen. You can have a, an offer somewhere else, right? But usually companies don't want to get into bidding wars. If you come to a company and say that's going to make you an offer and you come and say, hey, I got an offer for 10,000 more, you know, that's a bidding war. They're going to be, you know what? Okay, go with them because you're not truly really interested in what we want to do. And we have another hundred candidates that are willing to take this job, right? Because that's kind of like, you, you don't want to project yourself as you're, you're just looking for money, right? You want to look for money, your worth, fair value, and challenges that will allow you to grow, okay? So keep that in mind because that financial question always, people that just graduate always struggle with it. So, so those tips, I hope they help you. So then you show you know your worth, you do your research and then you get a fair uh, market value for your skill level and, and then you feel comfortable with it, okay? And negotiation. Negotiation, you don't have to give a specific number. You don't have to tell them how much you're making right now. You don't have to share that. So you can tell them, you know, this is the range I'm looking. If they ask you, how much are you making right now? You say, well, I'm looking for this range. You don't have to share that or disclose that. You don't have to, just as the company does not have to disclose how much they're paying your peers. So keep that in mind. And now is your turn, Jared. <laughs> yeah, no, I was actually just going to um, add a couple of bits to what you just said there. Um, I, th I think you, you got a lot of them, but yeah, like, like, what well, like you're saying here, Juan, make sure you know what your worth is going into the original recruiting interview. You know, they're going to ask you what range you think that you're worth. And it's really crucial that you know what that is. Uh, yeah. And it's highly dependent on your area. So, you know, keep, keep an awareness of that. Uh, as far as the kind of the tips that I was going to kind of cover, so we've been kind of talking about things that you should do, but there's also things to be kind of aware of uh, that the company might try to do that are potentially red flags for you on like whether or not you want to kind of work in this place. Um, and, and not all these are specifically red flags, but there's ways of navigating it. And Juan, you actually had mentioned one of the points there is that, so let's say that, you know, you're out there and you already have your first engineering job, right? And you're going to start out at some salary. But let's say, you know, after a few years, you're ready to, you know, go somewhere else to grow. Many companies, the recruiters will ask you, hey, how much do you make right now? And it's, it's honestly a trap question. They're trying to find out how much you're worth so that they can only offer you so much above that amount and as, as leverage. So what you do when they ask you that type of question, either in, in an on the phone or through an email is basically just politely say that through my research and you know through uh, you know in the area with my skill sets these little points here this is what i think my range is worth right so that's how you politely answer that question without actually saying how much you know you make um, yeah. to add on to i guess other types of things there's going to be some questions out there that are going to ask might ask questions and, and to some to some extent this is from people who are perhaps aren't uh, as skilled with interviewing or haven't been properly trained on interviewing, but there's a bunch of questions that you're not supposed to ask because they're technically illegal, um, many of them. But things like asking about, uh, you know, family planning, uh, you know, whether or not you either have a family or you want to have kids or whether or not you're pregnant or, you know, if you're a woman, and these types of things, uh, you know, many of these questions are just not appropriate questions to ask. You know, some companies might be trying to find out whether or not you're going to stick around for a period of time or not by asking these. And again, sometimes it's ignorance on the interviewer's sake, but if you have these types of questions and you're not, well, just honestly comfortable answering them, then just politely say that, hey, you know, this is not, I don't feel like this is relevant to my ability to perform this job. You know, I would, I would, I'm happy to talk about any details that specifically talk about, again, the skills that are required for the, for the job that you're applying for. Um, now, the flip side of that is that you as the candidate have the opportunity to kind of express a little bit more. So a very common thing in many interviews, but not every interview, is that when you first like get into the call, sometimes the interviewers will ask you, hey, give us a little introduction to yourself, right? Brief work history, education, and honestly, sometimes, you know, at least in, in my uh, opinion, it can also be helpful to maybe throw in a couple of just personal details that help humanize you and help add an aspect of that. So if you want to volunteer information about, hey, I have a family, I have this many kids, I have a pet, da, 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 these are some of my hobbies, then that can be, you know, I think a helpful thing to, to kind of work with that 
you know, that culture fit or, you know, things that you're interested in can be helpful, but don't feel like you have to do that. You know, if that's something that you want to volunteer and express, you know, that's up to you and it can be helpful to be able to do that. Um, but Juan, I'm kind of curious to know, uh, yeah, your opinion or your thoughts on, on any of those. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So some aspect there. there, when you shared about the money stuff, there's also the other side of the coin where let's say you're just looking for a 10% increase. Then if you're comfortable sharing how much you're making, you see it as a negotiation tactic. You say, you know what? I'm making $5 a year and I'm looking for $6 a year. If you cannot meet that, that's fine. You know, you don't continue the conversation, right? I mean, you don't say it like that, but uh, but the, the thing that like you, you ask, like, am I within your range? And they will tell you yes or no, right? But the thing is like, you already have some negotiation power after your first job. So for your second job, that you can use that as a negotiation power unless you're super underpaid. Let's say you got a job and you went and took the lowest in paying job to gain some experience, then don't use it. But if you're paying, being paid fair or something and you feel like you want to grow and get a raise and stuff like that, then you can use that as a negotiation tactic. So it's not entirely bad. It depends on your specific situation you know um because we we focus these two new graduates that are looking for the first job that's why jared said that you know you don't have to share it don't share it right it's a trap <laughs> uh because yeah like like you know it's your first job you have to 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 have some negotiation negotiation skill um another thing um when it comes to specific questions that are, you're not supposed to like be asked for example in my case i'm i'm an immigrant right and one question that many companies ask is like are you a US citizen are you a resident right they're not supposed to ask that. The question they are authorized to ask is, are you authorized to work in the United States, right? And you just say, yes, I am. Or no, I am not, right? Depending if you need a sponsorship. Or they can ask you, do you need visa sponsorship? If you need, you say, yes, I need. Right, that's it. But they cannot ask you, unless it is a federal government or a company that requires special clearance, they will ask you, you know, this is for US citizens. But the thing like you, they, you would know that already because they, you, you would have not applied, right? As an immigrant, because that's in the job listing. But other than that, if they ask you that, sometimes I have pointed that out to companies like, hey, uh, you're not supposed to ask that. I'm, I'm a citizen, but you cannot ask that. Or I'm a resident. You cannot ask that though, right? You are supposed to ask this, right? That's why they tell you uh, as a new immigrant, uh, because that could there could be discrimination, right? When you're authorized to work, there shouldn't be any difference. Um, about the questions, like the questions you ask, like, hey, tell me about yourself and stuff like that. These are the value-based questions or the value-based interview or the value-based portion of the interview. This usually happens after the recruiting screening call when you're talking maybe before um, you're talking with the manager before the actual technical interview or after the technical interview, a final interview with uh, the director of engineering or the engineering manager on the team. Um, so in those cases, like they're going to ask you specific value-based questions. Things they're going to ask you are things that they want to see how you align with the values of the company or how you align with the company. For example, if uh, because you did your research, let's say you're applying for a financial company and they ask you like, okay, so what would you like to work here? Be prepared to answer those questions. So I'm going to give you a list because we're almost out of time. Give you a list of questions to be prepared, right? Be prepared with these questions. Like, tell me about yourself, you know? Don't share your whole life story. Just share specific points in one minute or two. Keep that in mind, okay? More orient um, give some professional aspect to it, right? Because that's what they really care about too. But some also some personal aspect, but don't talk too much. Um, another thing is like, what do you speak about? this role or out of these roles, you know, uh, how do you see yourself in five years? They're not asking that just because it's a check mark or something to check off. No, they want to see how your five-year plan aligns with our five-year plan. Like we're looking to grow to a hundred million dollars, right? Then how your plan aligns with that? We are determining that when we're interviewing. You don't know that, or you don't have a five-year plan. It's kind of like, maybe you're not a good fit because we need someone with a five-year plan. Even if you're not going to be here the whole five years, right? We want to grow and we want to help you grow and we grow together. That's what we're looking, right? When we're interviewing. Um, other question is like a uh, common question, like, um, a conflictive situation you had with a coworker and how do you solve it? Be prepared to answer those type of questions. Uh, what is the best thing you've done, you know, in your career that you feel the most proud of? You know, be prepared to answer that. Um, uh, why do you want to leave your current job, right? If you're employed or uh, what did you leave your last job, right? What did you work just a year in your previous job? Be, be prepared to answer those questions, but always align it with what the company is looking if you're truly interested in what the company is doing, of course, right? Because you, you want to be there long-term, you want to grow with them. Um, and yeah, um, but, but yeah, I think we're out of time, Jared. So if you have one last tip, we have. 
uh, yeah, you, one, one last bit I would, I would add here, and this is obviously towards the very end of the interviewing process where let's say you are presented with an offer, which is amazing and, and great. A lot of people are not, don't have the confidence to necessarily ask for more money or to negotiate a little bit higher, right? You know, maybe an extra, you know, $5,000 or something like that. Again, highly dependent on the area and the percentages that you might be asking for. But I think it's important to remember that if a company is going to make you an offer, that means that they've decided that, hey, we think that we want you on the team. We want you to contribute to what we have here. And if, if you're scared that, hey, if I ask for a little bit more money, that they're just going to pull back the offer. Well, if the company is the type of company that's going to pull back the offer just because you're negotiating and that you're trying to push for more, then that might not be the, com- the, the right company that you want to work for because they're you know, nickel and dime you over a relatively generally speaking, smaller amount of money. So again, it is towards the end of the process, but I, you know, I would keep that in mind uh, is that, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with asking for more money. And I've even had bosses tell me before that, you know, they, they gained a higher level of respect for me because I asked for more money during the negotiation process rather than just taking it. But again, I mean, if it's also your first job, then I don't think there's any shame in accepting the base amount to begin to, 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 start gaining that real experience because you have to remember, remember remember that as well if you're coming out of a boot camp and you're looking for the job that experience is really the you know the golden cup that's going to you know progress your f- career forward but yeah that's my last tip yeah and something important with that like as long as it is consistent with the range you provided because let's say you provided a range between five and seven dollars a year and then you co- they come back and offer you seven dollars at the higher end don't ask for more money you're gonna yeah, screw yourself totally. With the offer, right? So keep that in mind. This is important there to give you some context because not all this. See if they come back with the lowest end of the range, right? Yeah, you. Be it's okay. Ask for a little bit more because they're offering you the lowest we're willing to take. You can negotiate, but it depends, right? It depends on the situation. Usually, great companies to work for, they're not gonna offer you the lowest range you gave. Usually, they're gonna give you something more or mid range. When that's the case, I think like that's okay just to take it, right? But it depends. Every situation is unique. Keep keep that in mind, but it's okay to to not just take the first offer because remember, comp- compensation is not just the the salary, but also comes you know benefits and other things. For example, let's say you get the offer, and yeah, we, this is the offer. You know, we're giving you the higher end you ask, but we don't have PTO, we don't have medical insurance. We don't, you know, let's say that's gonna in that case it's kind of like unique situation. Yeah, ask for a little bit more. Like hey, you know what? I need to cover these expenses or I was expecting to have some PTO or some other benefit, you can negotiate, right? Because see the compensation as a whole once you get the offer and see if that works for you. And because every situation is unique and it's okay to negotiate those things. You can try like um, me, myself also, like I've gotten offers and I, I have asked like, hey, do you have more of these or more options or is that, you know, and Worst case, they can tell you, no, we don't really. And that's fine. You can still take the offer and not take it, right? I mean, that's usually, that's why it's called negotiation. But yeah, no, that's a great tip, Jared. So yeah, that's it for today. So thank you for joining us in the in this episode of Dev Bootcamp Live. I'm Juan Lizarazo. And I'm Jared Potter. And we'll see you next week.